And tonight I'm going to tell you the greatest environmental success story that's ever been told. Everyone's concerned about the environment. Amongst our, our faculty here at Harvard, uh, a couple of the most influential people in the world, Ed Wilson, speaks regularly about the loss of biodiversity and the impact of this having on our planet, global climate change, extinctions, loss of biodiversity. Eric Shivian, one of the 100 most influential people in the world, and also one of fact faculty here at Harvard, likes to, likes to say that the root problem with that, of all of this, is that we don't see ourselves as part of nature. We see nature as being over there, and we're over here. Over here. And that affects the decision we make every day. And that's affected the way we approach the environment. We've had a lot of great environmental success stories in the United States. The, the creation of the National Park System was a great environmental success story. The creation of the Endangered Species Act was a great environmental success story. Uh, the creation of the, uh, the Nature Conservancy and World Wildlife. And that's the way we approach things. We like to protect habitat. And we like to protect the species. In the United States, uh, wildlife is considered resolutely as belonging to no one, but to be held in trust for the benefit of the people of every state. And that's a traditional approach. And that way, wildlife is protected. And that's a Western worldview. And that was the colonial worldview in Africa that was adopted by a lot of countries in Africa. But in 1967, the nation of Namibia, what was then German South West Africa, said, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to reinterpret the colonial law. We're not going to protect wildlife. We're going to leave the protection of wildlife to the people that are on the land, the people that own the land, that control the land, the landowners. We are going to give de facto ownership of wildlife to the people. Now that would horrify a lot of American environmentalists because they expected the wildlife to be exterminated. That's not what happened in the movie. What happened was that the landholders started to protect the wildlife because there was a profit here. And wildlife numbers started to increase. And income to rural communities started to increase. And it was such a successful model, economically and ecologically, that it was copied about 10 years later by Zimbabwe, what was now Southern North East, and a year after that by South Africa, where a true revolution in game ranching began. And ranchers who have struggled to grow crops on lands that were not suited for growing crops, or raise cattle or sheep on lands that were not suited for raising cattle or sheep, transformed their ranches and farms into game ranches. And over the next couple of decades, some 20 million hectares of land was transformed from cattle or sheep ranches to farms and game ranches. That's four times uh, the area of the national, national park system in South Africa, nine times the area of the state of Massachusetts. And not only did wildlife numbers increase, but the land was restored. It's a max storage. 20 million hectares of land being restored to natural condition. Wildlife population skyrocketing. It's not the greatest environmental story I've told. What's going to happen next is, because it was recognized that throughout Southern Africa, that there are rural people, tribal communities, villages, hundreds of tribal communities, thousands of villages, and tens if not hundreds of thousands of rural people that also had wildlife on their land, and that they could benefit from wildlife. Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Zambia, and Tanzania, called community-based natural resource management. Now that's an interesting phrase, community-based natural resource management. That's not government-controlled natural resource management. That's not control of wildlife by the World Wildlife Fund, or the control of habitat by our nature control of space by national parks. That's people having control of the resources on their land. And it's been so successful. And this is how the people profit from the wildlife on their land. I mean, from the natural resources on their land. 
craft production, marketing of film products, basket making and uh, urban products and things like that. Photographic and cultural tourism. The people don't, tourists don't always want to go to the land where these people live because it's not that scenic. It's miles of desert or miles of Mopani woodland. There's a lot of wildlife, but you have to look for it. And so the only people that really go to these lands are members of the hunting community. And this is a typical chart. Almost three quarters of the income throughout rural Africa to rural peoples comes from foreign tourists going to their lands to hunt with them. And that's caused this growth in wildlife populations. This growth in land available to wildlife. And I can show you similar charts for growth of income to people throughout Southern Africa. And that's the greatest environmental success story ever told. Not so much, although equally maybe, because wildlife populations have skyrocketed. Because land has been protected and restored. Because peoples have been empowered. But what also has been restored is the control of resources by people who live on the land. And the other thing that's been restored is the idea that Eric Schillian talks about, that we are part of nature. We are not separate from nature. And if this is as successful as it has been, national parks will be an anomaly in Southern Africa because there will be just as much wildlife outside the national parks. And the people will be empowered, the wildlife will thrive, and the land will provide full biodiversity. Thank you very much.